<laughs> Are we live yet? <laughs> hey everybody. Hey everybody, it's Andrew from Arrow Grow. Waiting for the pump to finish. Thank you for joining me. You can barely hear that though, right? It's very quiet. That's one of the things I want to talk to you about today. It's almost done. <laughs> can you hear it? It's kind of like a refrigerator. It's about as loud as a refrigerator. There's a reason for that. <laughs> we'll cover that in a minute, too. Let's see. Oh, there we go. All up to pressure. Hello again. My name is Andrew. Welcome to Saturday morning. Welcome to Arrow Grow. Welcome to the hydroponics, DIY hydroponics show. This is something new. You are now looking at my workspace. This is, I just just put this together because I needed something that I could show on camera to help you guys to see what I do when I'm working on all of this stuff. Because as if you've seen the show before, I usually broadcast from this, this desk that's actually right behind where the camera is right now. And that's all well and good, but it's kind of like being a, a, an evening newscaster. You can't do a whole lot of experimentation in front of you because all you have is your little pile of papers you need to read from. <laughs> so when I need to do wet experiments and spray water and nutrients solution and spray air and do all these crazy things we do in this I couldn't do it in front of the computer so here we are this is the wet lab this is officially constructed for the purpose of getting stuff wet and messy on camera so that's what we're gonna do so a little bit of Mythbusters thrown into this show so today what I'm gonna do I did describe it in the description but I'm gonna be taking this unit which is an aeroponics um, control center basically it is the pump, the air storage, and the electronic control for everything, all built in the one unit. This is one of the main products that I build here um, at AeroGrow. And this is going out to a customer. This is going out uh, to a company called Wake and Bake, which uh, Wake and Bake LLC in Miami, Florida. And <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, this entrepreneur who contacted me. Uh, found the show online, found on YouTube, and liked the products and liked what we do, and gave me a call and we talked, and it was a really good alignment. Um, it was this place, uh, this organization in Florida, company in Florida that's that's been begun by uh, um, who, this guy who's now become a kind of a friend of mine, uh, Marlon. Um, and Marlon uses this technique called the the Sea of Green, and if you can imagine this table. Uh, was a grow bed, and let's say it had a hundred pods in it, a hundred baskets in it. Oh. <laughs> five seconds. Cool. I'm going to unplug that while we're talking, just so it doesn't keep running. But if you can imagine, this was a grow bed with a hundred baskets in it, and each one had a, a small plant growing. Let's say cannabis plants, uh, for example, is what we're actually talking about. Uh, but you could do this with anything, but cannabis it's particularly suited for. So you grow your plants, your hundred plants, up to the point uh, and you trim them and so forth and prune them to the point where they grow one single monster mega bud on the top of each plant, one big flower. And at that point you harvest. So it's all about creating that one bud on top of each plant. And then so you have a sea of green. You have an entire table full of one bud, one bud, one bud, one bud, one bud, one bud and so forth all the way across. That's a sea of green technique. And that uh, Marlon decided would be well suited to aeroponics. The, 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 I don't want to go too much into the design. I don't know how much he wants me to talk about on air, but, or live rather. But um, uh, yeah, his, his creation and, and this unit together will make a system, an aeroponic system, which can be set up easily by the homeowner or the grower. And it is true aeroponics and it is a true sea of green technique and, and designed to grow super fast and super efficiently. That was the whole reason for this. And again, what I'm going to be showing you today is the unit that will be supplying the, the atomized nutrient solution into the sea of green beds that Marlin is building down in Florida. So what I'm going to show you today is just some of the final touches that are going on to this unit here before it ships out. It is built, it's been tested, it's been run for days at a time just to make sure that there are no bugs and no leaks and uh, no bugs in terms of problems, not insects, <laughs> excuse me, uh, so that there are no problems. Uh, everything's been worked out and tuned up. At this point, what is happening is I now take this unit and I kind of disassemble it a little bit just so that I can make some final preparations to a few of the parts. For example, 
This pump, when it ships from the manufacturer, it contains an oil in it. This is an air pump, right? And it contains an oil inside this canister. And inside of that oil is sitting the air pump. So the air pump literally sits in a bath of oil, which is interesting and unique and kind of cool. I never actually used pumps like this before. So this is kind of a new thing for me. But the one, and that's great, they work great, they produce very high pressure, they're extremely silent, as you could hear or not hear a few minutes ago. And the one downside is that they are filled with an oil that's not quite yet compatible with what we're doing. We need an oil that is completely zero chemicals in it, completely non-toxic. Uh, just it, not that it would ever be a problem, it's just that I, the air is passing by the oil, and I have to assume that in that air it'll pick up something, either an odor or something, that it would carry forth uh, to the plants. And I don't want that. We don't want that. So what we do is we take out the synthetic oil and we put in mineral oil, believe it or not. See, here's the thing. Before we had lubricants like we can buy in a store now, if you go to the... Uh, is it in there? Where did I put that? It's in the... Um, where did I put that? In the automotive store, you know, you can get 10W30 or you can, uh, for your car, you can get WD40 for your hinges and your house. All those kinds of oils are synthetic. And before we had synthetic oils, we had either mineral oil or vegetable glycerin. These were the two materials. I actually thought I had bought mineral oil. You can use either one, it's fine. This is the glycerin that I've chosen to use today. Uh, this is this is kind of an interesting product. If if it, uh, you watch a lot of gory horror movies, they use this to make the fake blood in horror movies. They mix this with a red food coloring and then a little bit of I think it's cornstarch, and that gives it a little opacity and thickness. And otherwise, it's completely clear. But this is what you make fake blood out of. So if you ever want to make fake blood for Halloween, get yourself a bottle of this on Amazon and get some red food coloring, number whatever. And uh, yeah, you mix it up with a little cornstarch and you've got yourself some fake blood all day long. Super cheap and realistic. However, we're not using it for that. We're using it for something quite different. We're going to take the original oil out of this pump and we're going to replace it with vegetable glycerin. But before we do that, we have to know how much is in it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to detach this. Okay, this is my, by the way, my first time working on camera uh, with uh, all this setup and tools and cameras and lights and all this in this particular arrangement. So if something gets screwed up, that's why. But I think we're gonna be okay. So let's see here. I'm just going to empty this out a bit. I just quick grabbed everything I thought I might need and brought it over in this box. It's probably way more than I need, but I'm going to take this puppy apart. All right. So something I want to tell you about this pump. This pump is actually a refrigerator pump. Yes, it's a particular type of refrigerator pump that is designed for the pressure that we need and uh, it's going to work really i'm trying to find actually one sec I have another tool over here i think will work a little bit better <laughs> yeah i thought i had everything i needed but apparently i didn't okay same old story right there that's what i'm looking for okay Thought it was here somewhere. All right, so uh, what we are going to do again, we're gonna take this out and we're gonna turn it upside down. We're gonna measure the amount of synthetic oil that's in here. And then we will be able to replace it with vegetable glycerin in equal, just an exactly equal amount, one to one, one to one replacement. And I definitely need to get a wrench on this okay ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm gonna turn this around and you know what I'll turn on the other camera so you can get a little better close-up look here Boop. all right okay the other thing I'm gonna do probably not while I'm on camera but I need to uh, do the final cementing of all this PVC together. I leave it loose while I'm building it. 
you know, like this, I can move it around, I can twist it, I can put it back together. Then when I get it in exactly the arrangement I like, then I glue it and put it all together. But for today, what we're doing is something a little more mechanical. This is really just the meat and potatoes of it. We're taking this pump off and replacing stuff, but there are other things that need to happen before it goes out. Geez, I wish I had a few other tools here. This is getting difficult. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there we go. That should make my life a bit easier. Ah, it just made my life a lot easier. Okay. Sweet. All right. I'm just going to undo them. I'm not going to pull them out entirely. So this pump I chose, uh, you know, <laughs> I think if anything in this business, what's happened is <laughs> if I've become an expert at anything, I think it's, it's an expert at pumps, it seems, because I've just, oh my gosh, I've experimented with so many different types of, oops, turn that back on, of pumps that I feel like I should just sell pumps for a living. But uh, this pump was chosen because the others were no good for indoors. They were too loud. And uh, some of them were very good. I mean, some of the pumps I experimented with were fast and they produced a lot of air, a lot of cubic feet per minute, but they were just loud. And I couldn't imagine anybody realistically using these units in a house where it was so loud. You know, out in, a, out in a greenhouse, sure, whatever. Out in a barn or storage area, whatever, that's fine. But in a house, eh, I don't know, I couldn't say it. Couldn't, couldn't imagine that. So as a consequence, ooh, I have air in this tank, don't I? I need to let this air out. Holy cow, that's going to be super scary if I don't. All right, so that's turned off. Let's just let the air out of this. So what do I do to do that? I hook it back up to the controller. This is, the, by the way, this is the head <laughs> it normally goes up here, uh, but it's off camera if I leave it up there, and I need it down here so I can show you on camera. So it pops right off, and you can plug it back in. And da, 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 da. where's A? Where did it go? Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Mm. Oh no, where'd I lose? Where'd I put my cord? Uh, anyway, so, um, uh, what was I going to say? I don't know, I forgot. That's on. Okay. Da -da -da. All right, what I'm going to do. I seem to be missing one of my cables. What the heck did I do with it? Oh, shoot. <laughs> All right, well, in that case, what I'm going to do is do this manually. I'm just going to empty this out. Excuse me one second. I'm just going in here. No, no, no. That's not a, that's not a control. That's so weird. Everything was just fine a minute ago, and now it's not. Where did I knock something loose? No, I've got power. Sorry, I'm having a little issue here. Um, I must have knocked something loose when I was just moving this a minute ago. Because now my controller lost power, which is weird. It's never happened. Huh. So strange. Yeah. That's so weird. I just unplugged it. It's been running for a week. <laughs> what the heck happened? Oh, I probably just knocked something loose. But anyway, uh, okay, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna let the air out of here. It's going to be really loud, so bear with me. All right, here we go. Okay, hold your ears. Ooh, that's under a lot of pressure. Okay. Let's try it this way. <laughs> All right. Yeah. There we go. Wow. He holds a lot of air. 
Okay, she holds a lot of air. All right, so that was fun. A little bit of drama on a Saturday morning. All right, so that's done. Now let's take this pump out, finally. And then we're going to empty the, uh, the existing synthetic oil out of it. Yep, that's loose. And we're going to replace it with glycerin, which is completely non-toxic, food grade, literally food grade. It says so right on the bottle. You could drink it. You wouldn't want to, but you could. Okay. Let's take that off. Yep. Take that off. You know, actually, what's cool about this is how easily everything comes apart. So... One of the uh, tricks to this was, let's see if I can get this on camera. One of the tricks was getting, let's see if I can show this here. Can you see that way? Can you see? Let me see if I can. Okay, can't really see that, can you? Um, well, I might have to get some better lights in here. Anyway, there's a tube right here. And there are actually three tubes on any refrigerator pump. Pull this forward a little bit. There are three tubes on this. One of the tubes is for filling it with Freon at the, at the factory if it's going to be used for a refrigerator. The second tube is to fill it with oil. And the third tube is the output, which is where the air comes out of. So we're taking the cover off of where the air comes out of. And we're taking... Well, Yep, I need to glue this all together before it falls over. Oh, no, it was on top of a screwdriver. Okay, so we're going to take this off as well. This is, let me get that on camera. Two tubes right here. There's one tube here, and there's another tube right... Jeez, oh, still can't see it. Okay, there's a tube here and a tube here. I'm going to pull the cover off of this tube. Okay. That's the cover, just covers the tube, just a piece of rubber tubing with a little cap on it. That's all it is. So now we have two copper tubes. It's this one on the left that I'm going to pour stuff out of. It's my air, in my air hole I'm going to now cover, okay, with that cover. Now I'm going to lift the whole thing out, whoops, after I detach it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, like that, and then I'm going to set this down like so, take these screws out so they don't get in my way, whoops, take these screws out so they don't get in my way, there we go. And then, so that we know how much oil we need to replace, I'm going to get a container. I'm going to measure it. One second here. I know I have a beaker around here because I just washed them yesterday. Okay, here it is. I don't know how much is in there, so I'm going to bring two. Because there may be more than we think. Sometimes factories use a lot. Sometimes they don't use a lot. Sometimes they use a bit too little, in my opinion. But anyway... Uh, okay, now we're going to very carefully turn this over. Um, is that the best angle for you guys? Let me see here. Let me turn that. There's the pump. You can see the beaker. Yeah, okay, we're good. So just in case, like I said, I have a second beaker here just in case, but hopefully we won't need it. And I'm just going to put this here. And I'm just going to empty this out. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> okay. And kind of twist it around to make sure all this gets out like that. Yeah, because it'll want to hide. Whoa. Yeah, it's going to want to hide all over the place in there. See, the pump itself has all kinds of parts on it, right? And screws and alleyways and all kinds of stuff. And it's literally submersed in this oil. This oil bath is what it is. So... In order to get it out of hiding, you got to kind of twist it around, shake it, do a little dance, do a little prayer or something. I don't know. There we go. See that? 
just when you think you're done, you're not. Now what we're actually going to do is I'm going to do this twice because I want to be able to sort of absorb all the residual and replace it. Okay, 200, it looks like they put in, uh, no, 100, sorry, 100 milliliters of, um, maybe I can get that on camera, let's see. 100, yeah, hard to show on camera, but it's 100, I have to tilt it to show you, but it's 100 milliliters of, of oil, okay? So, or, so we're gonna put that to the side and I'm gonna pour out 100 milliliters of glycerin. Glycerin. Fake blood. Bucket of blood. And it's, it's, I mean, it's oily, it's thick. It's good stuff. You can tell this is, this is definitely gonna lubricate something. Okay. Now, it doesn't look like blood, as you can see, it's because uh, there's no food coloring in it or cornstarch. But yeah, I promise, this is what they make fake blood out of. Okay, now, ooh, I don't have a freaking funnel. Uh-oh. Okay, we're going to be very careful. Let me get something just in case. This is brand new carpeting. I don't want to mess it up. All right. <laughs> Let me grab a, uh, just a plastic lid here, just something to catch any disasters. All right. Okay, so we are going to try <laughs> our best to pour this in here. Also, the tube that I poured that oil out of is the largest opening of the three. So that's, that's really the primary reason. You could have used any of the three, honestly. But I wanted to use the largest because it's easier, especially when you don't have a funnel. Being very careful, I'm just pouring it in there. I'm gonna switch cameras again. Boop. Okay. Okay, I'm just being very careful. Ah, that didn't work. All right. Let's go angle it a little more. Like that. Jeez, I wish I had a funnel. That would be so great if I had a funnel. I'm gonna put that on my Christmas list. One funnel from Santa. What do you want for Christmas, young man? I want a funnel, Santa. That's all you want is a funnel? How about a Red Rider sleigh? No, Santa, I want a funnel. Just a little tiny one that only your elves can make with their tiny little hands. Okay, there we go. Now we're getting it. Steady stream. Yeah. That's what I'd say when the doctor asked me how my. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, Saturday morning, I'm getting weird. Yeah, like Saturday morning is any excuse for my weirdness. Okay, this is probably not going to take more than three, four days. I don't know. It might be as long as a week. Oh, jeez, this is really slow. Okay, it's going in. It is going in, but wow, it's slow. All right. We're about a fifth of the way there. Just kidding. Whoa, too fast. Okay. Okay. Today, class, we're going to be working on a science experiment. Okay. All right. Get on in there. Wow. You know. If you have kids and you want to teach them about patience, have them do this and just be like, okay, this is, this is what patience is about. You stand here with this speaker for the next hour, <laughs> pour, <laughs> come on, pouring into a tiny hole. And when you're done, we will celebrate your patience. Okay. Wow. You know, there's probably a job in the world for somebody who has the ability to do this for hours at a time. It's probably some weird job in some experimental factory in Russia or something. We need you to pour this very slowly for the next three days. If you don't, it's the Russian front for you. All right. 
oh my gosh, this is just <gasps> so slow. Whoa. All right. So my grandfather was a chemist. I wonder if he had to do this stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. He probably had, probably had interns for this sort of thing. Uh, mm, yeah, he worked, uh, my grandfather, he worked for DuPont for most of his career, well, much of his career, down in uh, Delaware. He worked in the synthetic fibers division of of DuPont, which is where they make things like nylon and Dacron, Orlon, Teflon, Rayon, anything ending in an on, that's from DuPont. <laughs> that's what he worked in. Yeah, my grandfather was an interesting guy. All right, and then when he wasn't doing chemistry and developing materials for World War II, he recreated 18th century furniture by hand in the basement. It's unbelievable. He had a full woodworking shop. And he would be down there for hours at a time every night just recreating these, these 18th century pieces of furniture. And they were in the house, you know. I mean, you'd walk through their house and it looked like something from the past, like a museum or something, because they had all this furniture that you don't find anymore. It was interesting. All handmade by my grandfather. It's cool. All right, so this is almost getting close to being almost done. <laughs> it's, uh, I never thought 100 milliliters, whoa! I never thought 100 milliliters could go so far. Good Lord. This is like, ah, geez, now I'm getting impatient. I'm rushing it and it's messing up. All right, keep it slow, keep it slow. Oh, man. Well, I definitely did not think I was going to have to keep you on camera for this long with this, but I don't know how else to do it. i got to get this in there. Oh, I see. It's the angle. If you get the angle right, it won't back up on you. All right, so there's a tip for you. If you ever decide to do this and you need to fill this with oil, keep this tube, this filler tube, straight up and down. That will, whoa, that will at least minimize the amount of backing up it does because it'll create a straighter path into the canister, a uh, straighter path for the oil to travel. All right. Oh, geez, oh, Pete, that is like crazy. You know what? Maybe if I take this off, I think actually that might help. This is a, this, oh, come on. This is a really small tube, but usually they're a bit bigger than this, actually. I just realized that this is unusually small. And when you're dealing with a tubing this small, a tiny difference in measurement makes a big difference in practicality when it comes to doing something like this. Here's the other thing about tubing, I can tell you, is that if you go, for example, from a quarter inch piece of tubing to a three eighths inch piece of tubing, it doesn't seem like a lot. It seems like, you know, if you look at them side by side, you, I mean, you notice there's a difference in size, but not a tremendous amount of difference, but yet the amount of liquid or air that you can pump through that slightly larger size tube is very significant because you have to remember that, you know, you're looking at a cross section of it, but if you look at it for the entire piece of tubing that it is, you're talking about a, a pretty significant increase in volume, even if it's just a slight increase in tube diameter. It's a large uh, increase in capacity in the tubing's capacity to carry uh, material. Here's the other thing to keep in mind. With the tubing, especially when you're fitting tubing to these projects, tubing is measured, there are two different things you have to pay attention to. There's the inner diameter uh, and there's the outer diameter, or the outer measurement. So um, ID and OD. Inside diameter is the opening inside the tube. Outer diameter is the overall diameter of the piece of tubing. So how, how open it is inside and how wide it is outside. Those are the two measurements. So you could have two different pieces of quarter inch OD, outside diameter tubing, 
but the inner dimension would be different. And that'll mean that the capacity for that tubing to carry liquid or water is very different, um, depending on the size, depending on the capacity. So something to keep in mind. Also, here's another, here's another thing to keep in mind. Not all retailers of tubing are very good listing those measurements. So sometimes it gets a bit confusing. Which one's the outer diameter? Which one's the inner diameter? Did they mention it? Did they list it correctly? So just keep an eye out. Just be careful that you're looking, in fact, at inside diameter or outside diameter specifically and not mixing them up like some of the manufacturers do. Uh, I have run into that. Not often. Most manufacturers are pretty good about it, but... Sometimes you get a new kid on the block who wants to start selling this stuff from, you know, from China or whatever, and, and they, they, don't, they don't get the details very, very well. And it uh, makes it hard for us to figure out what we're buying, and that's why you have to sort of learn a little bit about tubing before you can be really accurate about what you're ordering. That's also why I'm going to be carrying it on my store, because I'll do all that heavy lifting and figure it out for people, and then they can just order it. They don't have to worry about it. Because I've gone through all the, <laughs> I've made all the mistakes. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this a while, so I've ordered a lot of incorrect things and learned my lessons along the way. There we go. We are, oh my God, it's almost done. Look at that. This is the last. Thank you for bearing with me through this. Wow, that took a long time. Okay, now we're going to test it. Whoa, let me switch back cameras. All right. Oh. Okay, now we're going to test it. And see, I don't worry about that on my hands because that's just, that's just, that's just glycerin. I'm not going to eat it, but you know, I could, it's glycerin. It's no big deal. I am going to wipe it off with, no, I'm not going to wipe it on my pants. Stop. Hold on. Uh, okay. Yes. There's a bathroom right there. <laughs> okay. So now we have some glycerin in there. What we're going to do is I'm going to turn this on. <laughs> this will be interesting. I'm going to turn this on and let it run for a minute. I'm hoping I did everything right so it doesn't blast out on me here. No, it shouldn't. It's down in the bottom. Um, yeah, let's just plug this in. Whoa, <laughs> I forgot to take the cap off. Holy cow, that was like a gun. Holy wow. I guess you guys saw that. Oh, that just shot right off. That was amazing. Okay, I'm letting that run. I'll put the air cap over the correct one this time. There we go. All right. Let that run for a minute. Swishy, swishy. Hear that? That's because I'm tilting it and one of the mechanics is tapping the side of this canister. See, it's in there, it's alive. <laughs> it's running. All right, that's probably, well, i gonna give it another minute or two. All right. Now what I'm gonna do, that's pretty good. Now, just to be extra, extra, extra sure that I have uh, gotten into all those little channels and crevices and nicks and crannies and all that, I'm going to turn this over very carefully. I need to not spill this out, but I'm going to turn this, actually, before I do that. Before I do that, hold on. Before I do that, I am going to, first of all, Get a proper rag, because this is about to get messy. Okay. There we go. Wipe that off. Now, I'm going to put a cap on the end of that uh, air tube, because I don't know where it went. Literally, when it shot off of there, it was like a freaking bullet, and it went shooting across the basement. <laughs> I have no idea where it is. <laughs> So here we go. I've got a little, a little cap in here. I'm just going to put that right in there. Boop. There we go. And 
Now we're going to, I'm going to cover these two ports with my fingers, with my fingers, whoops, trying not to touch the electrics, it's unplugged anyway, but, and then turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, swishy, swishy, turn it over, turn it over, swishy, swishy, move it around. Make sure it's going everywhere, like that, okay, like that, and you're good. Okay, now, now we're going to dump that out, all right, now that is contaminated, and we are going to, well, contaminated, I mean, it's picked up, the idea is that now the, the glycerin has picked up any residual uh, synthetic oil that's in there. And now we're just going to dump that out, all of it. And that should leave us definitely ready for a final filling. And I won't do that on camera. I'll, I'll spare you that. I'll do that once we're finished. I'll move on to other things. But you would then ref whoops, you would then refill it. There we go. You would then refill it and then you'd be done. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> again, you got to find the right angles on this to get it to drain out. See that? Ugh. Yeah. That one. There it is. Yeah, it's weird. You, you, you just hit that right angle and it just Hit that correct angle and just starts pouring out. Come on. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, you can tell it's it went in as glycerin, but it's coming out as something very different. So yeah. There's de definitely did the job. There. Yeah. Now what I may have to do to make this a little easier, I may have to let it run for a few minutes to heat it up. Because glycerin's a little thicker than regular oil, so uh, it's gonna it's gonna get thinner as it gets hotter, but yeah, boy, that's thick. Wow. Yeah. Can you guys see that? I hope you can see that coming out of there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's pretty good for now. All right. Now, ugh, move that to the side. That's yucky. All right. Now, I'm going to put this back up on the posts. And we are going to move on. So um, what I'm going to do is when I'm off camera, I'm actually going to do another dump of this, uh, this glycerin after I let this run. Whoops, that's backwards. Let this run for a few minutes. And uh, that should take care of it. And then I'll refill it with 100 milliliters of glycerin. And that would be that. I'm only going to put two screws in this right now because we're going to be coming back to this. Now, obviously, everything is, you know, I'll show you here, um, unplugged. You want to unplug everything before you work on it. You don't want to ever work on live electrics. So that, I've accidentally done that a few times, and I remember those times because they were quite painful. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, working on live electrics, yeah, that's, that's not, not, not a sign of genius. Uh, let's put these over here. Let's put this somewhere safe, not where I'm going to drink it. And so over here on the 3D printer, I think that's, yeah, visible on the top right of your screen, uh, there is a part also printing for the same customer that is uh, part of the system that we're working on. The part that's printing is a pump holder. It holds the return nutrient pump uh, for the system. And I'll show you what it looks like. The 3D printed piece looks like this that's being printed right now. It has some pegs on the back. And what happens is 
3 d printed part, another one with thumb screws on it, gets screwed into here. And then this gets hung on the bucket and the pump. Let's see if I can show you this. Oops, a couple of pumps here. The pump, uh, return pump will be mounted on the holder like this. This hangs on the bucket. The tube, le whoops, tube leads. I didn't spray my print. I did spray my 3D printer. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, one of the tubes goes back to your nutrient tank and the other tube goes to uh, the tent into the bucket where the nutrient solution is that you want to return. Or in this case, for this customer, it's going to be a big table, like a four by eight table. The spray will get sprayed into the inside of the table, feed the plants, and then a return motor like this one will then pick up the residual nutrient solution and return it back to the nutrient tank. And that's what this little motor does and that's what this little hanger will do is allow you to hang that on side of a bucket or on, si uh, on the side of the, the table or on anything. Um, that brings to mind another thing I want to show you, which is when you can, okay, here's the thing. I, I don't know how many of you are into 3D printing or if you're ever going to 3D print, doesn't matter. My point was going to be that if you're designing these systems, remember that you've got multiple pumps, you know, you've got a return pump, you've got a spray pump, you've got whatever. You want to try to design parts that can be used for multiple tasks because then you're only designing one part and making a variation on it. You're not designing 10 different parts that are all unique. One part with slight variations allows you to make changes quickly and allows a higher level of compatibility between the parts. So, it, for example, if I make all these bits and pieces to screw together with thumb screws, then I know that all of my holes that I print in the parts need to be big enough that I can then ream them out or, or tap them for five millimeter thumb screws because all my five millimeters uh, thumb screws are five millimeters. So that means that I can put together this entire thing with nothing but thumb screws because all of the holes are five millimeters designed to fit that size after I've you know tapped them out and put threads in them. So that's the sort of thing you want that repeatability that consistency from part to part it just allows you to use fewer parts assemble it quicker, make changes more quickly, and so forth. So that's how we do it here at AeroGrill. So for example, here's another good example of this. This is a magnetic plate. This is a magnetic holder for the controller. Here's another good example. <laughs> okay, all kinds of examples. This controller, okay, is attached to the holder with thumb screws. So I can take that holder right off and put it anywhere that I want, or put a different attachment on that's not that. put a different attachment on it and now it's magnetic now I can stick it to the side of a, a rack system you know one of these garage storage systems something like that anything metallic this one is specifically custom designed to fit the customers to fit Marlin's rack system because he has a whole uh, a whole uh, where a room warehouse uh, an area a grow area filled with these racks right so this will allow these controllers to fit right onto the rack magnetically pull it down put it up pull it down super fast the other thing is I developed for him a holder there it is same sort of idea same sort of idea right all it will also have thumb screws I haven't drilled it yet except that as you can see on the back the one is magnetic the other has the little tabs on it which you know what let me switch cameras that allow you to okay so you've got the magnetic one and then you've got the other one with the little tabs on it which allows you to just hang it off the the bars the vertical riser bars of his particular shelf system and this one is magnetic same idea but instead of using the little pegs it just goes and just stick right to the side of the shelf system. So these were custom designed for Marlin for his his business and these are going to allow him to put these anywhere that he wants quickly move them around quickly and they're very very durable and they're waterproof because they're PET G plastic PETG so it's a perfect solution for this environment and that's why we're doing it this way for this customer. So switching back to this here okay now what else did I want to show you here? I wanted to show you, what else am I doing to finish this up today? I am 
go, well, you know what? While we're standing here, let's run this pump because I need to heat that up. I need to heat that up a little bit so that I can get that glycerine out of there. So we'll let that run for a minute, heat it up. And let's see here. Now, let me show you something else here. I did say I was going to tap this so that I could put some thumb screws into it. Let me show you how I do that. All right. So again, 3D printed parts with the holes printed in them so that they are easy to tap later on. And what we then do is I use, I'll show you this, I use these little things, I can get them on Amazon. Uh, they're drill taps, okay? So the, the first part of this right here is a drill. It drills through the material. The second part has threads on it. So it drills through and then it starts to cut the threads. So drill, thread, 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 pull it out and you've got your threads. So, let's see if I can get that on camera. Is that, is that showing up or is it? Uh, man, let's see here. Focus. There we go. So if you can see that, first part's a drill, second part's a tap, and then it creates your threaded holes, right? All uh, right, now we get my focus back in here. Okay, so pop that in here. Slow speed, always slow speed when you're cutting threads. There are your holes, right? Very slow. Straight in, straight in, as straight as you can do it. And unplug that now, it's too noisy, it's driving me crazy. All right, go in. When you get to the hill, very slowly back out. Reverse the drill and back out. One more time. Go in slowly. Contact the threads, then go slowly again all the way through. And when you get almost to the hilt, not all the way to the hilt, you strip the threads out. Almost to the hilt, like that. Back out. Reverse your threads and back out. Like that. That's it. Then, blow it out, do it again. Oh, here's the other thing. Make sure you don't have any bits of junk on here when you do it the second time because they could, they could booger up your threads. This is very soft plastic. It's not, it's not hard. So it'd be, it's easy to cut threads, but it's also easy to strip them out. So second, that's called chasing the threads. And you can see there's more material I don't know if you can see that. There's more material that came out of, the, of that hole when I drilled it again. It's not, not much, but as you can see, maybe on my finger there, there, there is some residue in there. So you want to be careful. Wipe it off. <laughs> Wipe it off. Chase it. Chase it like that. And now you'll find that a five millimeter thumb screw Oh, did I have the wrong one in there? <laughs> I think I had four millimeter. I did. Oh my God. Only on camera. This always happens when I'm on camera. Uh, yeah, five millimeter. Okay, I was one millimeter short. That was a four millimeter. I'm going to recut with a five. That's okay. You can do that. You can, as long as you're going up, you can't go backwards. You can't go from a five to a four, obviously. But you can go to a four to a five. That is a five, right? Yeah. Yes. Boy, it looked, it looked unusually large for a minute. I'm not sure that was weird. Uh, okay, it looked like a six. All right. Cut, cut, cut. Almost to the hilt. Back it out. Clean it up. Second hole. Slowly, then cut. Almost to the hilt, then back it out. Blow it out. Wipe it off. And then chase your threads one more time. Chase it. 
Chase your threads on the second hole. Now, 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 it should be fine. Yep, there we go. Then you can just put in your thumb screws. They go in easily. They're super secure. That's great. Thumb screws I have found are just amazing with 3D printed parts. Uh, they're easy to work with. And like I said, it's easy to tap these, these holes, easy to drill them out, easy to strip them too. Be careful, don't over tighten these things because they will strip right out. But for most purposes, this is totally fine. And, and I mean just beyond prototyping. I mean, this, this is a functional part. Now, if you want to make this even stronger, what you can do, I'm going to show you this. I didn't think I was going to talk to this today, but I will. Um, you can use nut inserts. All right, let me see if I can find one here that uh, quickly. But yeah, here we go. I just ordered some new ones. These are all five millimeter. I'm going to start using these on, uh, on everything, actually. Okay. These are nut inserts. They're made of brass. Okay. They're just little threaded brass inserts. They're knurled on the outside so that they, they hold really well in whatever you're putting them. So what you do, all right, um, let's see, can I do this? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to do this on camera for you. What the heck? Why not? We're here, right? We're friends. We're all friends here. All right, let's, uh, let's get my soldering iron. Yeah, believe it or not, you need a soldering iron for this. All right, so get that, plug that in. Uh, let's get this one. Okay, let's plug that bad boy in and let's heat it up. Now, you need to heat this up. What we're going to do is we're going to take this nut insert and we are going to heat it up and then we're going to push it into the hole. And uh, this is super cool. I, you know, when I first discovered this, I'm like, why are more products not being made this way? This is really cool. So, all right, we're going to heat this up, but we're not going to heat. I have a soldering iron that will heat to a specific temperature, right? So I'm going to set it down to about 650. Be no, let me, let me think here. Hold on. What's the temperature? You know what? Let me look that up again. I think I have that wrong. Um, so, all right, here's, here's how you figure it. Pet G, this material melts at 200. Well, it turns it turns into a glass state. It's called melts <laughs> at around 210 degrees Celsius. Celsius, not Fahrenheit. So I print at 240 degrees. So somewhere between 210 and 240 degrees is the right temperature to melt this plastic. So. I am not very good at translating Celsius to Fahrenheit. So what I do is I go online. And I just go 220 uh, in, wait, in Fahrenheit. Four twenty-eight. Four twenty-eight. All right, so four hundred and twenty-eight degrees. Four hundred, let's call it four hundred and thirty. That's our so if I go down here to 430, let's go 440. I want it a little bit hotter. 444. Let's make it all easy to remember. 444. That's my number. That's my new number. All right. 444. And it's going to, now it's going to cool itself a little bit. It was a little bit hotter than that. It's going to lower down now. Now what we do is, if you look at these, there's there's a, hmm, how do, I, how do I show you this? There's a, a heavy knurled portion and there's a lighter knurled portion and then there's a flat portion. You want the heaviest knurled portion to be at the top, okay? Because the way this works, it, it kind of has a, like a, a conical pattern where the, the roughest, uh, um, 
narrowing is on the outside and it gets lighter and then lighter. So you want the you want it to go into the hole. So you want the heaviest narrowing to be on the top and the flat part to be on the bottom like that. So when you put it in to the hole, the neural part's on the top. All right. <laughs> I hope that made sense. That was way over complicated. All right. It's just hard because it's on camera. You're trying to describe something that you do with your hands, you know? Um, okay. So the flat, shiny, non-neuraled part goes down first, right on top of the hole. Then you're going to take your soldering iron. You're going to place it into the neural part, not touching the plastic, just touching the, the neural part. Let it heat up, and as it heats, you're going to be able to push it down into the hole. Now I've got it in there. Okay, I'm just going to watch this. Starting to go, it's heating. Starting to go, starting to go in. I can wiggle it now, I don't know if you can see that. Going in, going in, then it's gonna go fast. Once it gets hot, it goes fast. Twist just a tiny bit. Now it's hot, it's going in, I'm making it level with the surface. Level with the surface, making adjustments. Level with the surface, adjust it, adjust it, boom, <sighs> perfect. Now, let it cool. Take a look from all sides, make sure it's even, make sure it's flat, it is good. Make a little adjustment right there. Yep, good, good, <sighs> good, good. All right, that's it. Now I just did one, because I just wanted to show you, but now, yeah. Now, when you go in there, I will show you, oops, I wonder if I can actually show this on camera. Yeah, I think I can. All right. So now you've got a super, super solid connection that is with a brass insert. That is not coming off. Or if it did come off, let's put it this way. If it did come off, the whole thing is going to break. <laughs> so that's how much force it would take to, to relieve that, to release that. So that's how I do the brass inserts. And I, like I said, I am actually going to start doing that on all of these pieces because I do expect that people are going to be removing and installing these time and time again. So this will prevent undue wear on the parts. Uh, it's a good, good bit of protection. It only costs a few cents on my side to add these, and I think it does a lot of good. So you can look for those on AeroGrowth equipment, but you can also use them on your own. Okay, so let's go back to this camera angle, and let's see if now we have any more luck getting any more of that any more of that goo out of the pump. Because now I heat it up a little bit, not that much, honestly. I only ran it for a minute, but just for, uh, just for giggles, let's unplug that. Let's unplug that. Let's come back down here. Yeah, and again, uh, the way these are designed with 3D printed parts with PET-G, everything's like snapped together, thumb screw together, super easy that way because, you know, you don't want a lot of extra hardware if you can avoid it. I always say, it's kind of a thing I like to say, is that the best designed part is the part you don't need, right? So <laughs> if you don't need it, chop it off. I mean, that's kind of the final step is when you design something like this, you, you, you kind of, you design it, it, you build it, it works great, but now you've got a bunch of extra stuff you really didn't need. You realize that in the end. So now you got to strip it back down. And that's, that's what we have here is the stripped down version of lots and lots and lots of failed parts. Okay. Let's see if this, any more luck here? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Oh yeah. Oh boy. All right. That was worth it. <laughs> that was definitely worth it. Whoa. Wow. All right. Yeah, that was, that was a lot. Wow. 
I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, if I can, I don't know if I can do this. Can I just let that sit? Because I'm on camera. I don't want to be taking up all your time with this. Let's let that sit. Yeah. All right. Boom. Oh, God. If that falls, I'm going to have a mess. Okay. Nobody move. <laughs> nobody move. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's draining. I don't know if you can see that. If you can't, I'm sorry. I'm not getting any closer. <laughs> but uh, that'll drain out. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let that go for like 15 minutes or so. I want as much of that at this point. I want as much of that out of there as possible. Um, because at this point, when I do the refill, that's it. Uh, it'll be filled once more, and that will be realistically probably in there for the life of the pump. I mean, there's really no reason under normal, dry, clean circumstances, an environment like the inside of a grow room, why you would ever need to replace this lubricant. This is very long-lasting. There's not a lot of stress or pressure on this motor. It's doing a pretty easy job. It should be in there forever. So we want to do it right, do it once, and then just call it a day. And then when the customer gets it, it's got nice, clean glycerine in it, and uh, there are no worries about anything down the road. So either mechanically, because you know it's lubricated well, or contamination, because now you've got a nice, clean product lubricating your parts uh, that's food safe. So what else do I want to show you here? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I mean, there are realistically, there are a few other things I'm going to do to this before it gets shipped out to the customer. Like I said, I'm going to put, I'm going to glue everything together because it's still, it's still, nothing's glued, believe it or not, on this frame. Every single piece of this can be taken apart. I could have a pile of parts in, in three minutes or less if I wanted to. Um, and then assemble it all back together. That's another nice thing is uh, they can all be taken apart and put back together relatively easily, like an old Volkswagen Beetle, <laughs> kind of like that. My dad used to tell me about how uh, back in the 60s and 70s, people in college, you know, they get, uh, they'd get one of these Volkswagen Beetles and, and it would be in terrible condition. They'd have to rebuild it. You could literally rebuild the engine of your Volkswagen Beetle, which was an air-cooled four-cylinder engine, on the, on the table, on the dining room table. That's the way my dad would put it. He said, you could build it on the kitchen table, on the dining room table. Because it was so simple and so easy to take apart with common tools, that was part of its design concept, that uh, people did that. They, they did that. They absolutely did. Took them apart, put them back together. Same thing here. Take it apart, put it back together, just like an old Volkswagen. So, um, and parts can be easily, easily replaced. So that's, that's about done dripping. I'm at just over 100 milliliters here, so I must have had a little extra oil still in there that it got. And now it's all out. It's all out. Uh, you can be very confident at this point, that's why we measure it, that once you hit that 100 milliliters, if that's what's in your pump, that uh, you've got it all, right? So I am going to let that drip a little bit more because it is technically still dripping. Um, I want to do that till it just won't drip anymore, and then I'll add the glycerin back in. So the other thing I'm going to do before this unit goes out is I'm going to put a faceplate on this electric box here. Obviously, I did that because uh, I was still working on it. Uh, I'll provide, obviously, I provide some extra thumb screws because they tend to get lost. Um, folks, folks lose those pretty quickly sometimes. Um, what else am I going to do to that? No, that's about it, really. I just wanted to do the, uh, the oil change on this glue everything together, uh, get my extra parts bag together for the customer, and do one final testing, and that's it. She's out the door. So this uh, controller, oh, yeah, I can't really hook everything up quickly right now. I wanted to actually demonstrate this for you. I could do that in a different video. But this controller allows you um, control over the nutrient cycle, so how often it sprays. And then also over the return, how often it returns the nutrients back to the nutrient tank. And you can manually do that. You can spray using this button and you can return using the bottom button. Uh, it's just a manual override. When you're setting up the system, these buttons allow you to prime everything in real time. And then from that point, you let it go and the timers take over and there you go. So this will be going out to the customer within the next few days. And actually, tomorrow or the next day, or Monday or Tuesday, I'd like to be sending this out. And then we get to see how it performs in a real-world situation that's quite different from, from that which it was designed for. So this, this sea of green is, is really interesting to me, and, and I think it's going to work very well for that. 
and uh, we will see. We shall see. So uh, what else did I want to show you today? I think that was about it. Um, do leave some comments, though. Please give me a like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. I do intend on carrying forward this presentation, this, uh, this format for hydroponics. Uh, we're going to call it the DIY Hydroponics Show. Each episode will cover something different. Sometimes I'll be covering projects that are actually being sent to a customer. Sometimes it'll just be purely experimental. Um, I run a lot of experiments here on an ongoing basis, obviously. Uh, so we're going to take a look at those as well uh, here on this show. And I'm transitioning. So there's going to be two things going on on this station, just see so on this channel, just so you know. There's the, the released videos, which are edited, and I'm going to keep putting those out. And they show you specific... Uh, specific types of things you can do in hydroponics, certain types of builds, certain types of maintenance, certain types of nutrient solutions, that sort of thing. The second thing will be this show. This show will be um, episodal, episodic. <laughs> uh, so it'll be uh, different themes for every show, but like I said, it'll either be uh, something I'm working on for a customer or something just in general. So stay tuned for that, and then there'll be the produced videos, and that's the format for this channel going forward, produced and the live shows. And I don't know if all the live shows are going to be on the same day every week. Uh, I'll let you know. I haven't quite figured that out. But here we are. This is episode one. We're just getting ready to send this out to Marlon Silver in Florida. And again, Marlon has this amazing business where he is uh, building a company called Wake and Vape. And this company is selling cannabis-based goods or cannabis-infused goods to the public. This is a, a franchise opportunity for, for people uh, all across the United States. Uh, to get in on the ground floor, these are particularly going to be popular in states where legal growing um, uh, is, uh, is happening. Uh, not just there. I mean, he's selling hemp goods that you can buy in any state because they're, you know, it's not illegal necessarily to have hemp in your products. It's just not yet legal everywhere to grow it your, your own or to, uh, to buy it in an actual store. Um, but he is setting up for the near future where all of these things supposedly will be. Uh, legal and above board, and his business will sell these cannabis-based goods to the public, including uh, equipment like this that will help folks to grow their own uh, indoors at home, uh, using the latest equipment from the industry, using aeroponics equipment and hydroponics equipment. Uh, his products are American-made. My products, some of them, not all of them, some of them are American-made. Uh, this is obviously American-made. Uh, so that's something that's important to both of us, to Marlon and me, that these are, whenever possible, American-made goods that you can buy that will help with your indoor growing hydroponics, aeroponics, or just cannabis goods that you want to buy for, for consuming. Um, so Wake and Vape is, is dedicated to that, and so am I. And this uh, device will be something that... Uh, hope, well, we're in collaboration, so hopefully this will be used not only to grow products for Wake and Vape, but also if folks want to invest in systems like this to grow their own, Wake and Vape will also be a distributor for this equipment, uh, as well as me, as well as right from the factory. So uh, yeah, we're getting it out there every way we can, and I'm letting you in on the, the inside track on what these things really are and what they can do by showing you these programs, and that's the whole idea. Everything is fully transparent. Um, we want it to be that way. I want people to learn about this so they can do it themselves if they want. But I also want people to know what goes into these, that, that there is a level of quality and expectation that I expect from this equipment. And I want people to know that that's what they can expect too. So uh, handmade items are alive and well. American-made items are alive and well. And I am here to make sure that stays true. And so is Marlon, and so are plenty of others like us. So uh, thank you for tuning in again. Like and subscribe to this channel. And if you like this kind of content, this kind of get-your-hands-dirty content, please do check us out again. I'll be back next week for something else. Uh, we'll figure out what that is in the meantime, and next week we'll learn something else. It probably won't be this, because this, hopefully, with any luck, will be out the door this week. Uh, but I'll have something else sitting on this table next week. So stay tuned. Have a great week. If you did join us today live, thank you for that. And if you didn't, please do check it out. Leave uh, comments and let me know what you'd like to see on this channel. So have a great weekend. Thank you. And we will see you soon from AeroGrow. Go grow something. All right. <laughs> let me see if I can figure out this video board. <laughs> Bye.